Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. Today we have a new book to discuss and it is called When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill and it is a historical fantasy book. So let's dive right into it. Okay, going to brief synopsis. We, this is following a young girl named Alex Green from like really early, like four or five years old childhood all the way up to uh, basically throughout her whole life. <laughs> uh, although mostly up to about college. And it's set in a world uh, in the 1950s, for the most part, all into the 1960s, I believe, near the end and later in her life when you get to, like, the last few chapters, but mostly within the 1950s, it's very much of that time period, uh, specifically referencing women's roles in society, and, my God, there are a lot of themes. This, this book touches on a lot of stuff, but it's all focused in on the way society, love, and even just responsibilities can end up hurting you, the changing perspective of youth as they grow older, how they look upon their parents' actions as they grow, Social structures and taboo topics. There's there's a lot to dig into here, but let's go on a brief synopsis because I'm getting off topic. We're following Alex Green in a world where uh, people, but mostly women, but we do get a little bit of just everybody can do it, but it was mostly women because it's focusing on women's role in society, um, could, can change into dragons. And when they do so, they don't turn back to human and they fly off. Usually, they don't really come back to the world. Uh, it's seen as this, like, really taboo topic. It's making a direct parallel between um, women's sexuality and um, the dragoning, as it's called. So, like, the same way it's improper to talk about menstruation in public, especially back then, people literally treat dragoning in the same way. Um, and when she was a young girl, her mom got sick, came back. It's all mysterious, but her Auntie Marla was there to help her out because her father was an asshole. But then, in 1955, there was the mass dragoning. And the mass dragoning of 1955 was when around 300 women and young, and mostly women, but later revealed to also be young girls, and a handful of boys transformed into dragons in broad daylight everywhere. Like, it wasn't like isolated instances that were hushed up. People were always very subtle about it. Like, yeah, the firemen came down to deal with that fire. So why was there a hole in the wall? We don't talk about that. Um... And she and her aunt left, leaving her cousin, who was still a baby, in the care of her mother, who decided to raise her as her sister, and now everyone treats her aunt like she doesn't exist, and Alex has to deal with a world where her life is just falling apart. The dragon, the mass dragoning, from the moment her mom comes home sick, her world starts to fall apart, but it almost gets better for a bit. And then the mass dragoning happening, and it's just... One kick in the gut after another for her. Um, and she's de desperate to push through, desperate to do something with her life, desperate to become something more. She looks up to her mother, who was, like, top of her class to a certain extent uh, at school. She was a really good mathematician. Uh, she worked at a bank for a while, but because it was the 1950s, eventually she was supposed to, you know, settle down with a husband and stop working and tend to the house. Um, but her mother still, despite having to settle for that, still wants Alex to have an education. So it's this fight between her father the, and, and the schools versus her mother and Alex. You've got the, the dragoning going on in the background. People refusing to acknowledge it. Alex is a little girl, not understand what's wrong and wrong from the moment she was younger. Uh, her mother going overprotective and sick. Her father going easily distant. Her aunt, everybody insisting her aunt doesn't exist and that her sister was uh, her cousin was her sister to the point where Alex is constantly references how easy it is to just lie to yourself about that stuff to just pretend like the painful things didn't didn't aren't real because it's easier than facing it. And her new sister slowly growing more and more interested in dragons as her life gets just harder and harder. And yeah, that's just it. You she has to deal with a changing world, a world world kind coming trying to come to terms with the fact that. They're not supposed to talk about dragons, but 300,000 people turned into dragons and flew away. And they didn't come back. 
And it's the hole it left, the damage it wreaked, and why they did it, why they felt they had to, why it wasn't necessarily a bad thing that they changed or they flew away for a time, but that they didn't return left the world shaken and broken. And most of the people in the world were not willing to talk about it, to work through it. And so the wounds from it festered and grew and people kept turning into dragons and people just kept ignoring it because they were convinced it would go away. Throw into the middle of the fact that we're in the, the beginning of the Cold War. And like I said, it's a massive shit show. But it's also very compelling. Moving on to the new characters. So we got the characters. Alex, fantastic protagonist. Really like her. Very intelligent. Uh, very driven. Honestly, like, I don't think I could have done what she did throughout this story. Just, damn. Jeez. Uh, that, that moment in the principal's office was just like, do you need to, do you need to go outside and check on that? It's like, y- yeah, so you can look through the binder and see why your, your, uh, your sister should not be doing, drawing these things in class. Drawings of dragons. Just, uh, mm, fantastic. If you read, read this book. Oh, gods. Okay, we got her mother. Complicated figure. Not necessarily a perfect person, but she's de- done the best with what she had and you learn what she's going through. One thing that I really like about this book is that basically everyone's actions all the main characters, at least, and most of the side characters we get enough details on are understandable. They're not good all the time. In fact, I'd say most of the characters make shitty decisions on a regular basis. Even Alex does some really cruel things sometimes because she's still growing. Because everyone's still growing. Because everyone still has to deal with these things. And it's the people, and a lot of times the people you hate the most are the people who refuse to grow and learn. Um, like the principal or Alex's father. Uh, his fa- her father is also a piece of shit, by the way. Uh, I feel, like, really bad for her mother. But at the same time, her mother clearly did, to a certain extent, love her father. Um, she did enjoy raising Alex and, to a certain extent, her sister. Even if she was, you know, wouldn't allow them to even talk about Marla. She cared for her sister, even after the transformation. When we learned the details behind the mass dragoning, what happened with the mother on that day, what happened with Marla your heart just kind of breaks a bit. And despite how shitty the father is, and yes, if you read this, you will hate the father, okay? He is like the father knows best figure from the 50s shows. You know, like all those 50 sh- sitcoms and like the 50s culture. But he's like the worst version, like the zero redeeming qualities one. Like not even like the whole... Like, it's literally just, I provide for the family, so you all will do what I fucking say. And then he just does some horrible things. He he doesn't give a shit about Alex. He says he does, but he doesn't. However, and despite all the shit with her mother that he was clearly doing, you can piece it out, there are a lot of horrible things about that. Uh, and especially when he does to Alex right after her mother dies, like within a month. I'm not going to spoil that because it's a gut punch. There is a moment... And several moments, actually, where he talks and explains some things. And when he explains that, when those few moments seep through, you understand that despite all of his shit, like, he's a bad father and a bad husband and just generally a bad person. But he did, in some twisted way, love uh, Alex's mother. He did. He seemed to genuinely love her. And to the point where he eventually reveals something very shocking considering how prim and proper he is about how this is, uh, you know, unacceptable for polite society kind of thing. And he reveals that he once did something, vi- off- told her mother to do something in order to give her a better chance of life, and her mother refused because she wanted to be there to raise Alex. I'm not going to say anything more about that, because when you find out, it is like, it's this moment for him. Like, we got hints that he really did love the mother. So he broke down and all that stuff. But when he reveals to Alex in that last conversation with her, um, what he told her mother to do, you realize he did care for her. It, it, it wasn't a healthy love, but it was love. And one of the main things to the story is that love is wonderful and painful and sometimes acting on it can cause harm to those you care for. 
They specifically bring up the myth that involves Titanius in Eos. That's a, it's a Greek myth where the goddess Eos, the goddess of the dawn, fell in love with a human, human. And so she went to, but she was afraid he would die and leave her all alone. And she loved him too much to let him leave her. So she went to Zeus and asked him to grant him immortal life. Uh, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. And so he shriveled up in his old age, and eventually he was in such pain, so much agony, that he literally just collapsed in on himself till he was little more than a shriveled husk the size of a raisin. But the goddess loved him, and she always loved him, no matter what he did, no matter how he acted. So she put him in her pocket and began to walk around with him. And he essentially lives all the more uh, an immortal lifespan, you know, forever, in complete agony with her being completely oblivious because she has her beloved with her. And that's all that matters. And in basically the entire story is her, is uh, repeating this myth over and over again at you in different forms using metaphors. And it's like, yep, yeah, there's that myth. And there's that myth. It's one of the first uh, references that brought up. It come back over and over again how painful love can be. And yeah, the characters have to learn to let people go, to trust that they will be okay, and sometimes they won't come back. Like, you know, there's always that thing where if you love something, let it go, and if it truly loves you back, it'll come back. This story is like, no, sometimes you can love something, and it can love you. They can love you. But sometimes they won't come back. They will leave. Now, sometimes they will. Some people will come back. But not everyone. And sometimes it might be too late. Sometimes they might be different. Sometimes things could never be the same. And sometimes they might have to leave. It might hurt you. It might hurt them. But they will leave. And you have to let them go. And there are just these moments where I'm just like, wow, I could not do that. I would be one of the selfish people trying to hold on. I'd be one of the selfish people like the goddess Eos holding on to the end. And it's just this moment of realizing that in their situation, you might not be as good a person as them, which I think is a rare quality in protagonists and in characters in books and movies and stuff. A lot of the time, you want the character to do the right thing, you know, the hard thing. You, you, you think that if you were in their situation, no matter how hard it is, these were the stakes i do it, you know? Like, say, for the end of the world. Of course I'd give up my leg to save the world. I live in the world, or my family. It's like, yeah, maybe, but my brother really needs to die. It's like, uh, those things are one thing. But it's different when it's like this. And I think if I were in those situations, if I had those kind of connections, uh, granted, I'm speaking of someone who has never felt romantic love for a single person on this earth, but I was able to feel a f- shadow of it, I guess, for... From these characters, or at the very least, it put me in their shoes of this longing, this want for something. Uh, which again, kudos to the story. A fantastic story. That's what the story really is, though. It puts you in their place. These, it has these long moments where these characters just stare at each other and the, the sheer horror or the sheer terror or the sheer agony just takes over the writing as they break down what's going on. It's like, this can't be happening. Please, no. It's like, it is. No. It, no, it is. No. You you don't. I, I can't. It is. It'll be fine. There's one scene in particular that's also going to make you hate their dad. Like, you don't like their dad from the early on because you're an Alex and Sue's, but there's a moment where it crosses the line from he's a bad dad to he's a horrible person. And you will know, if you read this book, you will know exactly what moment I'm talking about. So yeah, Win Win More Dragons is a fantastic story with great characters, excellent writing, a an ability to instill emotions in someone who really enjoys vicariously experiencing emotions through books. So, uh, also, I listened to the audiobook version of this, and the audio reader was fantastic. The voice actor was, let's see here, Kimbler, Kimberly, Kimbler, Kimberly Farr and Mark Bramhall did the voice acting. Kimber, uh, Miss Farr did the, 
uh, women and Mr. Bram, Bram Hall did the men. Uh, I believe Ms. Br- Mr. Bram Hall also, uh, Mr. Bram Hall was the, mainly the, uh, scientist. So in addition to there being dragons world, one of the things that also caught my attention is that it has, uh, sort of a scientist breaking it down in between chapters with a bit of overlay with the main plot. He's sort of like a side protagonist, if that makes sense. Uh, you kind of get his plot through snippets in his documentation, some papers he's released. Um, and Kim, and Miss Farr does Alex. They're both fantastic, wonderful voice actors. They really nail down the different characters. Uh, Farr is really good. Alex's perspectives, this, you know, lost little girl constantly being thrown in situations she is not ready for, but she, you know, she's too young to do some of this stuff, but damn it, she's getting it done. Mr. Bramhall, fantastic with the scientist. He's a front, he's really cool like him. Uh, he's a scientist trying to push the government to officially recognize dragoning, to research it, to help people. And he eventually pull, plays a main part in a turning point in the plot that uh, I can't say any more than that. Just going to say that. It's good. It's all good. So, yeah, this is about a 15 hour, 30 minute uh, audio book. So it'll keep you busy for a decent amount of time. You know, if you go to work regularly, this is a good thing to put on. All in all, this book made me feel, like, exhausted. Emotionally exhausted, almost. Like, I just felt like, oh my god, they earned that ending. I'm sorry. They earned that ending. It does kind of cut, it does kind of cut from, uh, the in like, mid through college all the way to now we're just doing a brief overview of major events throughout the life. And it's like, yeah, you could have done the rest of the life, but this book is already pretty long. Now, granted... I would have been all for another, like, 20 chapters exploring her adulthood and growth into eventual old woman status. The ending, as her as an old woman recounting all this information, the parallels to the beginning, and the allusions to the knots that keep coming up, all fantastic. But yeah, I do think it could have used a little bit more time, but quite frankly, it's still a masterpiece. I'm going to give this a ton of 10. Like, I would have liked 20, 20 extra chapters, but I barely finished this in time for the review on time, and... Well, technically, I didn't finish it on time because I was really busy this past week. So, you know, it worked out for why I needed it. And I still think it is one of the best pieces of historical fantasy that's come out in years. Uh, which is saying something because I really do like historical fantasy. I'm about to read that uh, Babel book. I think that's going to be historical fantasy as well. And I'm a big fan of the uh, the Anatomy of Dragons books, the Marie Brennan. That's really good as well. If you're like this, you'd probably like that as well. Uh, that's technically a fantasy world because it's not taking place in Britain, but it's taking place in not Britain and all the countries are just different names. So I have a review for that as well. You can find that on my channel. Check it out. Natural History of Dragons is great. If you liked When Women Were Dragons, you'll like this. 10 out of 10. When Women Were Dragons, you've made me... Kelly Br- Barnhill, you're officially on my... Uh, you're on my watch list. I'm going to see what you give me. Okay. Now that we're done there, we're going to move on to the spoiler section. Now... There are actually some major plot reveals that I'm going to be talking about. And this is a book that is best experienced blind, so you get the full weight of some of the moments. Like, if you get some of this spoiled, it's not going to have the same impact. So, I highly recommend you go into this blind. I recommend you go into most things blind. And then, you know, once you've, you know, once you've seen it, come back here. Listen to my spoiler talk. See if you agree with my opinions. Hey, it gets me, gets me more listens. I like that. Or watches if you're doing this on YouTube. So, uh, yeah. All right, moving forward. When when were dragons? Oh dear, where to start? So, Alex's uh, mother had cancer when she was younger, and she had to get it removed. She survived it. Her aunt nursed her back to health, and then the dragoning happened. Uh, it's implied that, and so basically, what happened was her aunt uh, gave up everything to essentially raise her. She enlisted in the army during World War II, became a pilot. Uh, but she didn't, like, settle down and get a husband once all the men came back. She, you know, um, she stayed and kept working as a mechanic. She, they tried to keep replacing her with, like, a guy so she could, like, find a husband and, you know, settle down. But every time they did, uh, they basically had to go running back to her. She's like, we can't run this place without you, please. Uh, so she would just, like, say, yeah, I get it. I'll be back. <laughs> uh, she took a lot of time off to go help Alex's mother. And Alex's mother grew angrier and angrier with her because she, you know, felt like Alex's mother had a future and she gave it up for society's expectations. 
Uh, but Alex's mother sees almost raising Alex as a little more important at this point, and she does believe that we're supposed, you know, she's supposed to follow these restrictions. This is the way society is. This is how to follow it. Uh, and she eventually starts refusing to see Martha unless she gets married. So Martha Mary is literally just some ra- random drunk asshole. Uh, and she's like, yeah, I'm married now. Now I can keep seeing you because you're the only reason I'm still here. Uh, which turns out to be very true because eventually she just can't handle it anymore. And she dragons, leaving behind her child and killing her husband, who was kind of, kind of an asshole. So we don't really mind. Uh, anyway, so, you know, Alex and Alex's mother takes her, her cousin in. Alex always loved her. Her name was Beatrice. And she, you know, goes about. Alex has a uh, friend named Sonia who she becomes very, very close with. But then when the school start, you know, nobody wants to talk about anything. Alex is growing a little concerned. She thinks adults are being ridiculous about this. Why can't we just talk about dragons? Uh, one of the defining moments of her early childhood actually was that, like, the first thing you open to is Alex going to this old lady's house. Um, because she used to always get sweet. She was a really nice old lady. And instead she sees a dragon. And it just kind of winks at her. It was staring in amazement at itself, freshly transformed, and then just winked at her and flew away. Everybody pretended the old lady never existed, and the house became like a taboo, don't go there place. We don't talk about why you don't go there, you don't go there. So, all of it was just so oppressive. Like, Alex didn't care, though. She was just a kid. She had Beatrice. Beatrice, oh, her precious Beatrice. She really loved her cousin, and she ended up almost treating her like a daughter, eventually. Um... And her mother refused to talk about her aunt, even when like the church decided to publish her try publish her aunt's name on a list of those who disappeared, because not everyone was okay with everything disappearing. In fact, there were even some uh, women who came back to their husbands and were like, "I want to still live my life," but eventually, the yearning to leave to be free just they just left. So even even the ones who wanted to keep going, the world just wasn't accommodating to them, and it wasn't even just that they. Uh, couldn't help out. We see that later in the book. It was society. It just wasn't willing to adapt for them. Not yet. And yeah, so Alex grows up. She becomes, you know, can, as she grows, she learns to just keep, go along with society's expectations, but she still pushes back in some ways. She really enjoys learning and schooling. She gets to be really advanced in her classes, skipping skipping over courses and taking extra stuff at the library through correspondent courses. Librarian encourages her like her mother did. And her father keeps talking about how Alex just needs to not take... Uh, constantly gets upset whenever Alex or her mother brings up going to college because she thinks... And he says this specifically, which is one of the first things you think of him as an asshole and a bad father slash husband for, uh, is... Uh, her mother took a spot from a promising young boy who most certainly should have gone to her place. And it's just like that moment of, I want to slap him. Like, we all want to slap him when he says that. We all want to slap him when he says that. So, yeah. Uh, and he's very anti-Alex going to college. And uh, the school principal is also friends with him and kind of an asshole as well. In fact, one of the, he calls Alex into his office one day. Uh, because, and the main reason he calls her in there and the way he solves it is just the worst. So the principal calls her in there because Alex has been making all the schoolboys feel bad <laughs> because she's at the top of the class. And so in order to not make them all feel like they're idiots or like that, that a girl is beating them in, you know, math, <laughs> Uh, they, the Catholic school has to not post the rankings anymore because it keeps showing Alex's name at the top and a lot of students are getting frustrated by that. Uh, it's just this moment of, so you're upset at her because she's doing too well in her classes. What the actual, like I had to like take a moment to go, the fifties were the worst. The fifties just sucked. I'm sorry. Any principal who looks at a student doing well and is like, you're doing too well. You're making everyone else feel bad. I'm like, go fuck yourself. No, I I think that's a perfectly reasonable reaction. Um, So yeah, do immediately hate the principal, but Alex's mother is the one that comes instead of her father for the meeting. And, you know, her mother is like, well, I do want her to 
to have choices and to do this stuff. Yes, I want her to eventually settle down, but there's nothing wrong with getting a math degree and learning and pushing the boundaries of your intellect. She wants Alice to go to college, believe it or not. Uh, which really shows that despite her agreeing to society and agreeing that there are certain rules, sees that if you have the money and if you have the talent, a woman can go to college. That's something society has allowed in the past. And to her, it's something Alex should have the opportunity for. So even in the restrictive 1950s vibe, she you do see the mother pushing back in some ways. And there's very small ways, but you do see it. Um, especially after Martha disappears, the mother becomes very more certain. She starts a garden in the backyard without telling her husband. And then when the husband's like, I, I didn't say you could do that. I don't really want one back there. Well, sorry, I've already picked. I've actually already been uh, getting groceries. So I actually reduced our grocery bill by just growing some ourselves. You've actually been eating it for these last few days. So apparently you like it fine. And I was just I was like, good for you. Good for her. Uh <laughs> Like every time, every time she, every, every time anyone makes a fool out of their father, I just smile because the, like, like I said, the father is an asshole, and I will be getting to him in a moment. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm getting to the first thing right now. So, like I said, Alex had a friend named Sonia who she was very close to. She, she was in love with her. She was a kid, and Sonia was a kid, and they didn't realize it. She was from Nor- Norway. Um, her parents had immigrated to America. Or more specifically, her grandparents had brought her with her because her father went off to find her mother after she dragoned, and he never found her, and he just vanished. Um, and, and Sonia believes her mother flew off into the stars, and their father was wasting his time, even if it broke his heart. Again, it's the whole thing of trying to hold on to things even after they're gone can cause you pain. Uh, but her and Sonia fell in love. Like, they, it's not even subtle about it. It's like, no, no, no. It's like... It's in that way of, like, they were so... She was so beautiful. Like, literally, she has a notebook full of pictures of a thousand-year picture of Sonia. But it really is just an art book with a lot of poses. But obviously, even if, you know, Alex doesn't realize what it is, uh, her principal realized. And I don't think he really cared, but he saw a way to hurt the girl who was somehow making his life... You know, challenging his views. And so... After his, her mother, and it's very clear because after her mother refused to do anything, he revealed that he took her notebook. Um, it's like, she's been drawing this. Look, your child is doing. She's clearly out of control. I'm right. You're wrong, woman. And it's like, and when her mother realizes it, she freaks out and she shows her father and they forbid Alex from seeing her. And now Alex is very depressed because Sonia was basically her only friend. She taught her how to draw. She showed her music and stuff like that when Alex hadn't really. She taught her folk tales to tell Beatrice. Beatrice loved her too, which Alex thought was great. And they told and they threatened their grandparents so that they could not talk to each other. Um, and then Alex is like that for a few weeks. She's just dead inside because you know she loves math. She loves learning, but. One of the core pieces of happiness in her life for the first time since her aunt was ripped away. And then she finds the gut twist, the the twist. See, eventually she gets sick of it. She goes to the house and she finds out that it's for lease by her father's bank. Her father, realizing he couldn't stop her from seeing her while Alex was grounded evicted a family just to get rid of a girl because his daughter was in love with her. Which, wow. And also, yeah, that's something somebody in the 50s would do. God damn it. We've come a long way, haven't we? Mm. I mean, we're not there. We're not, we're not perfect, but like, we're better than this. This is just, damn. My God. That's just, like, absurd. But, uh, yeah, as you can imagine, that's the moment where you're like, oh, he's an asshole. <laughs> but at least at first you think he's just a 50s asshole. You know, like, he's an asshole by our standards, but in the 50s, a lot of people did this stuff. It doesn't justify it, but it's more of, like, he was normal by the standards of the era, and now those things are not normal. They're not cool. Do not do them. Uh, sort of like how he smokes, smokes indoors, you know, that kind of thing. But then the big one happens. See, as Alex gets older, she feels a lot more pressure, and her mother starts getting sick again. 
And when she collapses one day, her father's like, how could you not have told me? And actually seems to be very, very scared for his wife. Uh, she has cancer again. And Alex finally finds out why her mother got sick all those years ago. And her father realizes she's going to die. And he has this moment where literally like the only time he cries in the whole series, he breaks down in tears and is like screaming at Alex, get this stuff, get the things. I need to get her to the car. We need to get her to the hospital right now. And he can't bring herself. And after a few visits, he just stops coming to the hospital. The first sign, but at first you're like, okay, he's grieving. And he might have been, honestly. Uh, that is up to debate. The, the nurses do not have nice things to say about him, but he is the kind of person who would try and push it aside. Of course, after she died, he mourned for like a few seconds and then started moving on with the most horrific plan I have ever seen. Like, this is so bad shit. This is like bad parenting shit. Like, it doesn't get much worse than this unless you're trying to actively murder your kids. Um, so here's what happens. We learn that some of the arguments. So throughout the book, there are these background arguments that Alex hears. And she doesn't ever figure out what they're talking about. I do. Uh, Martha constantly calling himself him no no good, uh, mentioning how do you put up with it, and I can't believe he did that. Uh, his trip, her mother getting upset after a long trip sometimes, and then a month after her mother's death, when Alex alone in the room had to sit. Had, was asked by her mother to keep saying a poem for her. It's the poem of Eos, uh, the, you know, God's the dawn holding on to that human, that same, that poem, you know, the poem about that myth. And oh my gosh, she eventually dies. A month later, he walks in with his secretary and she says hi and talks to them and her father. And, and you're immediately like, he was cheating on her. And now he wants to move his new mistress into his house. And you're like, well, that's pretty shitty, but oh, we're going to take the kids for a ride. Okay. And at first I thought he was going to get rid of Beatrice because the woman is like, I've always heard how wonderful you are, Alex. And, you know, specifically, you know, doesn't look at Beatrice. But um, they take both of them for a ride. And they pull up at this apartment building with a moving truck that has all their things. Yeah. He brings them up to a house. Alex realizes what the hell is going on. They're being left here. This is their new home. Beatrice has no clue what's going on because she's still like a four or five year old. Uh, Alex is... I think at most in middle school, maybe, I think she might be in high school at this point. I'm not entirely sure. I think she, she was either in like last year of middle school or high school. Like I said, what the hell is going on? We all know what's going on. And he doesn't want to admit it. Alex keeps asking him, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't leave us here. It's like, you're perfectly capable of taking care of He doesn't even say what he's doing. He just keeps saying, talking about how uh, capable Alex is, how she's perfectly able to raise a dog, uh, someone. Um, she can, you know, totally go to finish her high school education, and he will pay for the room and the groceries and all of their needs. They just can't be at their house anymore. It looks bad if you have the kids from your last marriage when you move when you have your mistress move in a month after that wife died. Yeah, he actually says, it would look bad. My God, I wanted to, like, I wish I could, like, jump into the book's world briefly and just slap him. Like, just, like, physically take him by the lapels, slap him a few times, like, what the fuck are you doing? And he just leaves them in the apartment. And Alex has to care for Beatrice while studying for, while studying, while finishing high school. And taking college level classes outside of high school in correspondence. She has to cook for them. She has to go get their clothing. Uh, the grocer brings their groceries to the house in an arrangement with the father because the father doesn't want her to be seen going certain places alone to get food or stuff like that. Because why isn't your father driving you here, dear? The schools aren't even given 
their address. So when there are like emotional problems or behavioral problems, the letters get sent to their house, their old house. The father doesn't open them. And eventually they get stopped in school saying, we've been trying to contact you, your father for months and he has not responded. You are in big trouble. You're all in trouble. And Alex has to go there and pretend the father is constantly sick because the, because he made, because he's implied and he never outright implies or says it, but it's a very understood part of the relationship that the only reason he seems to be doing this is for appearances sake. And Alex is terrified that if anyone finds out, like if, if it becomes like super public, if one or two people find out it's not a big deal, if it becomes like a big deal or public, he might stop sending them the money they need to live. It is one of the worst things I've seen a character do outside of trying to murder someone. <laughs> like, oh my god. That is just atrocious. And it's made very clear that even by the standards of the 50s, this is fucked up. <laughs> like, he doesn't want people to know because he knows this is a horrible thing. Everyone assumes she's living in a house with her new stepmother and her two new brothers that she never met. Literally, the book makes it very clear she never met her two stepchildren. Step siblings. Her her father had two other kids, and even by the end of the book, it is pretty clear she never met them. That is absurd, right? Oh my god! It's just that moment of just like, oh shit! Like at first, it's just like this life and times book. Like it's like she's growing through difficult times, but it's like, oh no. That was the easy part. That was the innocent childhood. And remember, the innocent childhood had her best friend getting evicted by her father because she, she had, you know, was in a uh, gay relationship with her. And her, her grandmother, her aunt turning into a dragon, killing her husband, leaving her, uh, daughter with, uh, her mother to be raised as her sister, her aunt being stricken from all the records and her, and the aunt herself disappearing into the wind. And that was the easy mode. She just gets exhausted and broken. And without, and eventually she starts snapping. Um, she becomes bitter. She becomes angry. She becomes terrified. She almost becomes a reflection of her mother in a lot of ways. Uh, Beatrice starts becoming obsessed with dragons. Which again, remember it was a big no, no, no. That's a taboo topic. We don't talk about that. Uh, and, Al and one day, uh, and the librarian tries to help her, and Alex ends up biting back at her a few times. The Al and librarian is very understanding. She realized what was happening. She tried to help Alex as best she could, and Alex apologizes later. She just becomes so stressed. Um, but she manages to get through her classes. She manages to get Beatrice to keep going to classes, even though she's you know very rowdy, and. Things seem to be going well for a moment. Then all her trauma comes back in full force. See, um... God. So, the scientist uh, that we talk about, this doctor who started to study the dragoning, she knew he knew uh, her aunt from the Air Force study he conducted. She was one of the people... Uh, several of her colleagues dragon, including a woman she was very close with, i.e. she lo was in love with. Uh, for Also, by the way, he's like the only person, uh, like the only like guy in the 50s who seems to be very okay with that. Like, even back then, he's like, oh, they loved each other in a very special way. It was very sweet. It was like, oh, you know what? Good for you growing up in the 50s and being progressive. Good for you. But, uh... <laughs> Uh, he, he, well, he's very outside the mainstream, though, when it comes to that. He got blacklisted by a bunch of places for trying to publish his research. Uh, and he was also part of a potential, uh, he was also, hint, hint, a part of a secret collective, the Wyvern Society, who tried to study dragoning. But they did it very secretly as to not get blacklisted. And him publishing all this stuff and making himself public, despite hiding their names, uh, meant he was essentially blacklisted from them as well, because they couldn't be in contact with him anymore. 
And despite this, and despite being brought in front of the Un-American Activities Committee, you know, the people who were trying to see communism in literally everything that wasn't exactly this t- this this society right here, right now, because no change, because all change is communism. Uh, oh my god, that, that bullshit. Thank goodness we don't live in the freaking Cold War. My god, all that wasted time. I have a personal beef with the anti-communist sentiment of the Cold War. Like, I don't really think communism worked as an ideology, and it definitely got hijacked by Stalin, but, like, the overreaction to it was just absurd. I mean, don't get me wrong, it, like, the people at the head of it were pretty fucked up, but America essentially regressed for a few decades, which was not fun. I think we might have been in a better place if we had just been a bit more chill, but that's me. <laughs> hmm. Anyway... <laughs> Off topic, uh, there there are too many themes in this book. There's too much to talk about. Uh, <laughs> too much too much content. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, by the way. Uh, anyway, so Alex's um, aunt is brought back because he basically went to... He found where the dragons were. He talked to them. Apparently, after their initial transformation, a bit of rage, they you know have their humanity. They still are intelligent. And... He tells them about how much their disappearance has meant. It, he even is like, I understand why you left. I understand it was hard. But you left. And you left all these people behind. You left daughters and sons. You left husbands and parents. You left people. And there is a hole in our world now. And no one is willing to address it. And as long as... And, and he even says, it's because you weren't there. Because if 300,000 people had turned into dragons and stayed, no one could have avoided talking about it. But they left. And so people have gotten used to ignoring it, just pretending this gaping hole isn't there. Because the thing that was pulled out of that hole isn't walking around next to you. Which is a very good point. He makes a good point there. And so they decide to come back. Not all of them. Not all of them. But the people who... Realize they left things behind, come back. And it's calm. It's not this burst of rage or whatever. They just show up one day in a few towns. They sit outside the houses. Uh, the father calls Alex being like, oh my God, have you seen this? And like, it's like, no, we don't have a radio. I don't have time to pay attention to the news. I'm studying. It's like, okay, don't pay attention to anything. But at her school, there's this fire drill, and she be- hears something on the roof, and she sees something fly away towards her house, and she realizes what is happening almost immediately. She goes there, runs home, faint, calls in sick, you know, goes to the nurse's office, gets a sick, says she's sick, runs straight to her, runs straight to her old home. Not her new apartment, but her old home. She finds Auntie Marla there, now a dragon, holding onto a purse. Waiting for someone. And she breaks down. This isn't a happy reunion. This is a broken girl who's had to shoulder, essentially becoming an adult at like, you know, in high school. Uh, with this woman's daughter after her sister died and she wasn't there. And she just rages like, get away, get away. And uh, Auntie Marla is very understanding. She's upset when she hears that her sister is dead. She's grateful. She says that uh, uh, Alex has been a great mother to Beatrice, and she's so thankful for that. Um, and she says, "I'll be at your place the next day." Uh, she also says, "If it weren't, if it weren't, you know, if situations were different, she'd probably burn this house down with the father inside." Which, yeah, I I would like to see that. We do get to hear about her burning place down, but it's after the father's gone, so it's not as big a deal. Mm. But, uh, yeah. And Auntie Marlo shows up again. And then Alex, I forget if it was either before or after this, uh, Alex starts dragoning. It's this really sudden thing where Alex is, uh, not Alex, I'm sorry, uh, Beatrice. Beatrice is just, like, staring one day, and then suddenly she starts changing, and Alex just drops the food she was making and runs over and hugs her. Uh, even as her skin starts, like, blistering, because dragons get really hot, their scales are very warm, to the point where tears, like, evaporate off them. Uh, and she doesn't care. She just grabs me. It's just like, no, 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 no. Because, remember, dragoning and is one of the things that essentially, like, killed her life, she feels like. Like, 
it ruined so much for her. It took her Marla, it dumped Beatrice on her, and she lost Beatrice, but she wasn't ready to be a freaking mother. And she just is, can't lose anyone else. She's lost everything at this point, honestly. She feels like she's lost everything. Um, even when Marla comes back, she feels like she's lost everything. Because, I mean, it really is almost like she has. Her father kicked her out. She lost her home. She lost her father. She lost her mother, her aunt. She has a chance to go to school, but she might be willing to give that up because the only person she has left at this point is Beatrice. And she begs her not to do it. And Beatrice manages to shift back just a little bit. And she goes back to being human. It hurts. She wants to go. She wants to go fly. She wants to go be free, to run free. And she just can't because she knows that Alex loves her. So she'll hold it in. She'll feel the pain. She'll hold back on doing what she wants. And yes, this is the allusion to that myth where the goddess held on to a love, even when it was painful for both of them. (sighs) Essentially. Yeah. She's, She's doing something that hurts someone she loves because she can't bear it otherwise. Um, Auntie Marla starts coming by, seeing her. Alex is, of course, you know, not Alex, uh, I keep saying Alex. Beatrice is, you know, obviously obsessed with dragons, which I can, I'm so into Beatrice because, like, that obsession with dragons, like, I feel like I would also be obsessed with dragons. Like, uh, dragons are real. They're amazing. It's magic in real world. Ugh. Mm. But, um, and Auntie Marla just keeps coming by. There are a few other dragons on the block as well that keep going there, and obviously they're also being like, don't, you left, you left us. Um, and, and Auntie Marla is very reasonable about it. She's like, well, I'm here now, and I want to be here for you. And you need me. You clearly need me. So I'm going to keep going back. Doesn't matter. How long it takes. I'm going to, at the very least, make this right. I should, you're right. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be a dragon. But I did have a responsibility here. I should have come back for you. I should have come back. I should have been a presence here. I shouldn't have let you try and ignore this. And she's very understanding about it. And Alex grows to more or less tolerate her. Not really... Willingly, more of the fact that you can't really stop a dragon from doing it once, especially when all the cops really, really don't want to bother with them. Like, they'll come by, but it's not really clear what they plan on doing since it's revealed that dragons are bulletproof. So, yeah. Oh, not really sure what their plan was. Um, and then there's this night where Alex goes to prom. She doesn't really like the guy she goes with. He asks her and she's just so shocked. She's like, uh, sure, why not? And she ends up dancing with, and there are all these dragons watching the prom on the roof. And she ends up dancing with a bunch of other girls uh, instead of her own date. And all of a sudden, they transform, and she's left all alone. Which is basically a metaphor for how everyone seems to leave her, especially those who turn into dragons. Which, you know, also hurts a lot. She feels this longing of, why wasn't I called? Why can't I hear this song? Uh, there might be a reason her mother might have used, like, this old Celtic knot to stop her from changing. Maybe. It's possible. I'm not entirely sure on that. There was this old myth thing that was recounted by one, the scientist guy. And there was the whole knot thing with her mother. So maybe. I- I'm not really sure. The knots kept going undone, so I don't really think that happened. And Alex does feel it at one point. So maybe not. Anyway. Um. This is around the point where she just breaks down. She just... I don't know what to do. I don't know anything. And her um, aunt and the librarian come together and they help her. They help her. The aunt reveals that their mother had fun squirrel away from college. Alex is admitted to her college of her dreams. And they even have a property that her mother had used some of the money she had squirreled away for her. Secretly away from her father. Um, this is also around the time that Alex goes to confront her father one last time after Auntie Marla comes back. Uh, the first time, actually. Uh, this is before the prom thing, so I guess I should have talked about this. Because this is actually a really good scene. Um, and so she goes to talk to her father. 
She won't take no for an answer. She just keeps going, keeps going. Eventually, he lets her in. Turns out the wife's gone. She left him. He's drunk. The house has fallen into disrepair. Seems basically all his money these days is either going towards uh, her and Beatrice's upkeep and a bunch of booze. Which you kind of feel, like, not bad for him. Because even after his wife left, you know, the whole appearances thing, he didn't let ask them to come back. Didn't even try. Which, I mean... I don't think they should go back. He was clearly abusive, but like, you know, uh, continuing to threaten them that he's going to stop paying for them once uh, Alex gets out of high school and making them financially solvent. Although it might be because he just doesn't have money anymore. Uh, it, it's very, imp- it's heavily implied he might just not have the money, but <laughs> uh, it doesn't stop the threats from being dickish. Anyhow, she goes there and she tells him, it's like, what? Why, why, why didn't mom go with her? And he reveals the only redeeming thing, aside from that moment when he broke down when she, her cancer came back. The only moment that stops me from being like, he is evil. Because he's not evil. He is a horrible person. A very, very, very flawed person. An abusive father. A horribly unfaithful husband. But... He reveals just how much he loved her, which makes things complicated and messy. And I don't want to feel bad for this guy because I really want to sock him in the face. But he reveals that before the weeks leading up to the dragoning, everyone who transformed felt it. They could feel the call, this need to be to just walk out of their skin and be free. And Alex's mother felt it. And she told her husband. And now, based on everything we knew, you would think he would be, like, bringing her to doctors to try and get them to prevent it or whatever. But this is after she started recovering from her cancer. And they know that it's very likely the cancer will come back one day. She'll go into remission. And so her father – and so her husband does the literally only redeeming thing I have ever read him doing in this book. He says he begged her to change, to turn into a dragon. Because there were theories, very quiet theories by mostly blacklisted scientists, and it was a generally thought but not spoken of idea that when you change into a dragon, you it was magic. You transformed and it cleaned your body of illnesses or imperfections. Now, it's later revealed that's maybe not, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's we don't have enough studies because, you know, this phenomenon didn't start being studied until like a decade before that conversation later happened. But it was a possibility. And even later on, it's still like, it might save her life. Maybe. Not guaranteed, but she'd probably have better chances than if she stayed human. So he asks her to change. But she refuses. Because she knows that Marla is going to change. And that's going to leave Beatrice and Alex alone. And she very clearly does not trust the husband to raise them properly. Which is entirely fair. He would have abandoned them in an instant. And he talks about how, oh, if only she had done it. And I could have remarried when you were still young. When you could be taught properly. Which means that he was, you know, probably still going to abandon them. But he was also going to try and make sure they didn't you know, want to learn math or like dragons before he abandoned them. Um, and he even says, like, I agreed to take your, I agreed to take Beatrice. I agreed to anything if she would just transform. And you really do feel like this is his moment. This is like, he's this guy who has followed society's rules for the most part. I mean, yeah, he cheated on her. He's done a few bad things. But for the most part, he sees himself as an upstanding citizen in the 1950s. He's still a shit human being, but he feels like he's obeyed society's rules. And for the most part, he has. Because even, you know, with the cheating and stuff like that, it was mostly just make sure it's not a big fuss and don't make it public. These things happen in private kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, that's messed up. It's not a good person. He's not a great person, but he was a a law-abiding person, if that makes sense. (laughs) 
and he decides that society can go fuck itself. His wife's life is more important. But she still says no. And you feel bad for him like that. Especially after his wife died. You like you understand his grief when she got sick again. It's like, if only she had said yes, she would have lived. Like, he literally didn't care if he saw her ever again. Which is weird. Because by the standards of this of this book, by the lesson it's trying to impart that sometimes you had to let them go, even if it hurts you, even if you don't get to be happy or you feel hurt, you can't just make them stay with you because it makes you feel better even if it makes them hurt. He kind of was trying to do that. Like he was trying to perform the lesson no one else learned until later, which is you have to let things go even if they might not come back. It was assumed at this point that dragons just didn't come back, period. Like, the people who came back briefly right after the change ended up leaving. It was basically a well-known thing that when you turn into a dragon, you're never seen again. And he was willing to let his wife go if it meant she had a happy and fulfilling life elsewhere. And if she wanted to change, she clearly wanted to. The call is implied to be something that you have to want. You have to want it. It's not something that just takes over you. It's a desire you have. She wanted to change. He wanted her to live. And even if that meant he was not happy. So I don't like saying this about him. Because again, I made it no clear. He's an asshole, a bad father, a bad husband. But he loved her. And he did try to give up a lot for her in that moment. And that makes, and what's interesting about that is that a lot of books and stories will have people that are uncomplicatedly evil, you know? And again, he's a horrible person. He's almost an antagonist for a lot of the book. As much as society, but it's more of society itself, but he's a representation of that society for a lot of the book. This callous society that doesn't see women or other people off to the sides or those who dragon that's willing to just assume it's not important. Just ignore it. And he's a, basically the walking representation of a lot of that, along with people like the school teachers or the Un-American Activities Committee. Um, and seeing him learn this lesson, in a sense, seeing him have this moment of humanity, makes him a way better character, not a good person, but a better character than a lot of uncomplicatedly evil villains. Now, I like pure evil villains, but when you have a character like this, it's actually a lot more interesting. It's like, wow, now I kind of want to dissect him. He clearly loves these rules. Like, was this the reason his marriage fell apart? Because the wife was clearly unhappy eventually. Um, like, did he, and, he, and it's clearly implied he started becoming a drunk, like in subtle details we learned that this drunk drunkenness had gone way longer than when the second life, wife had left, when his secretary had left. I wonder if this is why she left. Like, he couldn't love someone else. He only loved her. Like, did he actually care about her in his own messed up way? Is that why she stayed to an extent? Despite, like, maybe their relationship was slightly better than we saw. Now, granted, he seemed to be a bit abusive. And, like, you can't condone that. But it's interesting. A character is more interesting when there are traces of what you would consider to be positive traits in a negative character. It's good writing. Uh, I remember when I read that uh, book, The Book of Night, for example, and you had that billionaire who, like, cut apart other people's shadows in order to become a, a glomist, and he did all these evil things, with, like, torturing and murdering people to sacrifice for dark magic rituals, and it's like, that guy was pure evil, but he didn't really have a motivation other than, I'm a greedy, rich asshole, now, his daughter was a bit more complicated, but she wasn't really a villain so much as a unwilling henchman. And you don't really get that a lot. And that's what I'm saying. Books don't really do this kind of thing with their characters. So I thought it was worth talking about. Moving on from my long rant about how much I hate, but also I hate the father as a, as a person, but like him as a character. Uh, not to say I agree with anything he does. I need to make this very clear. I do not like him or agree with him in a lot of ways, but I see that he is more complex than the simplistic vision we initially had. Funnily enough, that adds us into the next part, the growing up and watching the world change thing. 
This book is the best example I've seen of how a child's worldview changes over time. We literally start in a f- almost foreign 1950s. And our worldview evolves in tandem with Alex in both the characters and the setting to such a degree it feels like you're growing up with her. I'm not even joking. It is breathtaking how good the writing is here. Kelly B- Barnhill, please write more stuff like this. I need more stuff like this. Like, holy shit, this was amazing. Oh, God. I don't give a lot of books 10 on 10. I don't. Because there's always a slow part, but mm, this was fantastic. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 This is just so good. I have so much trouble. I've been going on for an hour. Uh, I really need to wrap this spoiler section up, so let's go speed run to the last. Alex goes to college. She starts getting over things with her brother, and then she finds Sonia again. Yes, she finds her at college. They have a running romance. The world's getting better. Alex is doing amazing. She finally decides to let Beatrice change. It's scary. It's frightening, but Beatrice is fine. She changes into a dragon. She loves it. She's so happy, Alex. Thank you so much. I'm, thank you. I'm happy. I'm happy. And she doesn't run away. She doesn't leave Alex. She stays. She's her sister. Her cousin. Her daughter. And she, yeah, she cares about Alex. Um, she's living with her aunt, her wife, and the uh, two other wives. Uh, they're aunties. They're aunties. It's... Like a house with like four, like now five dragons and a human. It's very, very fun. Um, and Alex is getting really close to Sonia. They're like in a relationship, like on full on. And then the last thing happens. The second to last chapter, well, the third to last chapter is essentially the end of the overarching growing up story. The last two chapters are essentially overviews. And it's the gut punch. The last final gut punch. We all know it's coming. Alex has. Every So, Alex learned her lesson, but she learned it too late. She made Beatrice suffer from the dragon. She slashed out at Martha. She lashed out at the librarian. She came to terms with them, but she hasn't had a moment where she was faced with a problem like Beatrice changing or her mo- or Anne coming back, and she accepted it from the beginning. She, lo- she proved that she learned, essentially. And that's what Sonia is. So, Sonia brings her up to this astronomer's house. It's the end. They're nearing the end of college, and she's just, Alex, I need to talk to you. I know why my dad didn't find my mother. It's because she, so a little context. Dragons in this story are basically just full on magic. They can breathe in space. They can, don't need to breathe normally in case, I guess. So they could literally just fly into space and travel through the stars. And Sonia knows that her mother went up there. She feels it. Um, and she admits that she was also around some other girls the night of the second uh, minor dragoning. The, the night where Alex's uh, other classmates transformed at prom, that was, you know, that was happened all over the place. It was called, like, the Little Wormy, I believe, because it was a smaller thing, like, less than, like, a third of how many people did it in, or, like, less than, like, a tenth, I think, honestly, of how many people did it when everyone transformed during the Great Dragoning. But it was mostly younger girls. So they both talk about how they were alone, how they wish to join them a bit. And then they kiss. And Alex feels Sonia getting warm. And she feels, for the first time, a bit of the calling in her. And Sonia reveals that she never felt the calling, even though she kind of wished she could. So she could be with her mother. She could be with her friends. She could travel the cosmos and look for the woman she loved, her mother, who left so long ago. And when she saw Alex again, she heard the call. But she decided to wait. She decided to let Alex finish what she had. And when she felt everything was as good as it could be, when she could wait no longer, she brought Alex up here to ask her a question. Will you come with me? And Alex, who throughout the whole story, just sometimes because, you know, almost being proud of it, sometimes uh, being scared of it, some uh, possibly happening to her, sometimes wishing she she could, feels this fire, this warmth. And 
you as an audience realize she's felt a bit of this the whole time. Whenever she got angry, whenever she got furious, whenever she rebe- pushed back against the society, told her she couldn't be this, she couldn't be that. She's been feeling the call this whole time, and she finally hears it. And Sonia says, I can't hold back anymore. I'm changing right now. Please come with me. We can be together. We can go to the stars, live our lives in love, and follow and find my mother. We can be happy with the countless others amongst the stars. We can live long lives and travel and drink in the universe. Alex is a scientist at this point. She wants to study astronomy, and she could go see the stars herself. She could still do it. Sonia could draw them, drink in every sight. But Alex has things she wants to do here. She wants to see Beatrice grow up. She wants to live lives with her aunts, who she's finally on good terms with. She wants to contribute back to this world. She wants to help others like her, like the librarian helped her, who passed away of pneumonia about a year ago. She wants to better this world. She wants to go with Sonya. She really does. But she doesn't. Not because she doesn't want to. Not because she couldn't. She realizes in this moment she could dragon. She could finally change. But she decides to stay. And she decides to do that because she wants, she knows what she wants out of life. And she realizes it's not what Sonya wants. So Sonya leaves. Travels to the stars, and Alex stays behind. She lives a long life. She helps uh, dragons find, do tons of things. She makes scientific discoveries. Her she helps her sister as she becomes sort of a peacemaker. Basically, dragons show up during war zones and just block the bullets with their body to stop people from hurting each other and force people to negotiating table by just standing there as invincible little walls, uh, which is really kind of cute. I love it. Uh, she's there when her sister, you know, she's on stage with her sister as she, her sister, her beautiful little Beatrice accepts the Nobel Peace Prize. She lives this long, well-deserved life. She marries again. She finds other love. Uh, she marries another woman named Camilla. And the last chapter is just her. She's moved back to her hometown, actually. Right across, right down the street from her old house. Not because she wanted to be near that place. She can't stand it. But because it's where that old woman was. The first dragon she ever saw. That old woman with the chickens who gave out candy. It's always nice to all the neighborhood kids. She dragoned and flew away. She winked at her. And now she's that old woman in that house. Alone. A white life well lived. Her aunts are getting old and need people to take care of her. Even dragons get old and die. And they were pretty old when they changed. So their lives are even, you know. But they're still alive. Dragons live. Isn't probably they live like twice as long, I guess. No exact numbers are really given. But she's there. And her Beatrice is now having to essentially take care of her. She. It's kind of funny the relationship they have. Like, they've had a relationship of cousin, sister, Alex being the mother to Beatrice as a daughter. And now Beatrice is kind of mothering Alex. And it's just this wonderful cycle of, yeah, they, they're family. They're family in every sense of that word they could possibly be. Except for the gross one. Uh, the, the, for the, for contest, I'm talking about incest. No, no, they don't do that. No, it's, it's familial love, not romantic. Um, but so. And Alex basically says, so it begin, ends where it begins. And the knot is tied. And there's a symbolism to it. And it ends ambiguously, but the ending, and I, this is personally, this is just pure headcanon for me. Um, cause we know Alex could feel the dragoning now. She chose all this time not to do it. She made the world a better place. My headcanon is she even, she, she essentially takes the role of that old woman. She turns into a dragon after she gives her speech, uh, to us as the audience and, some kid finds her, she winks in reference and flies off. Maybe she'll go find Sonia and see if she can see her one last time. Close that, but that book's probably closed. No, no, she won't go find Sonia. That book's closed. She'll fly off. Maybe go play around Beatrice for a few years before she dies too. It's this sort of somber ending. Like the world is kind of calm. Like all the motion has left it. Like, 
it, it, the book makes you almost feel old. Like you've done all that you need to. You've experienced. You're so exhausted, but you're satisfied. And can't wait for it to just reach that nice ending. Oh my god, that ending was just like so good. I oh, I love this book. Mm. So yeah, this is the oh my. We need to wrap this up. It's uh, <laughs> uh, adding the intro and outro is gonna be around like a hour and twenty hour fifteen minutes. Okay, let's hurry up. So that's all of this. Um, I am very excited about this book. I'm a little disappointed too because I was hoping this wouldn't be as good as it was because now. I'm probably not going to be able to get Book of the Year to the Golden Enclaves. Like, I, I'm i not sure if Naomi Novik's going to be able to top this. Uh, the fun, dark fantasy subversion with with really good characters. And I really like Naomi Novik's character. Personally, I think they're uh, my favorite some of my favorite characters in fiction. I love Elle. I love... Um, Orion. I love Orion. I love her friends. I like the school. It's all really cool. But I just don't think the story is going to be this emotionally impacting and this well written. Um, I'm really hoping I'm wrong. I've also got that tabble, uh, that babble, or the necessity of violence, an Oxford study of blah blah blah. Now the title is going to be a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've got a lot of stuff coming. coming. Look forward to that in the future. By the way, uh, if you didn't know, I'm on YouTube. There's a link in the description. I'm also on Twitch. I will be streaming to both YouTube and Twitch on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, we are playing through Vampire the Masquerade's Swan Song. It's actually a lot better than I was expecting. Very different than what I was expecting given Vampire the Masquerade's Bloodline. And in addition to that, <laughs> uh, this coming weekend, I'll be watching Stranger Things Part 4, uh, Season 4, Part 1. Uh, Netflix is breaking up into two parts, so I'll be reviewing Part 1 and reviewing Part 2. So look forward to that. Uh, after that, we have... Well, I'm not really sure. I still need to plan my, uh, next few things this weekend. Oh, no! I forgot to plan everything. Ah, uh, that's a lot of work. Okay, I'm gonna have a busy weekend. Uh, you guys enjoy. I hope you really like this review. It's one of my longer ones, so... Have fun with it. Oh, gods, this is gonna be a nightmare to edit. Bye! I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode, and thank you for listening to The Dragon's Library. Please, subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. The Dragon's Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week, and you can follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library 2. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for all your support.